Thanks everyone for staying. Um, Thank you for staying. Yeah. How many people have you? How many people have seen the film before? Wow. Hardcore, <laughs> like fam. And uh, we have some people here who worked on the film as well. Just want to mention them too. And um, there's Paula here who did the stills, so the epic poster. Paula Harrowing, check out her work. There is Stella Nuimo, who's one of the co-producers at the back. <laughs> Sophie Otley, one of that, the actress in the toilet. <laughs> and I think there's Lulu. Lulu, where are you? Oh, I can't see. Oh, oh right there, there's Lulu, who is the other co-producer. I don't know if there's anybody else who... And uh, Tania, the lead actress, just stepped out for a bit. But, um, she's here as well. <laughs> okay. Um, because uh, this season um, is looking at kind of conditions of production uh, in uh, female filmmaking, um, that was one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to curate BD Women with uh, Stud Life. Um, and personally, it was like, it's actually really fantastic moment for me to see these two films together because I first saw BD Women in the late 90s and that was the first time I encountered Campbell's work um, and then when I saw Stud Life at Flair a couple of years ago um, I just was like I've got to have these two films together because obviously there's so much resonance between both of those uh, pieces of work um, so I just wanted to kind of take your mind back to the mid 90s um, when you made BD Women, um, because I think it's important to uh, highlight what was going on at the time, which was BD Women was funded by Channel 4. And at that time, that was the very early days of Channel 4 when they, um, the reason why they um, um, started, they were, had a big diversity remit, which was one of the remits was, was to fund uh, filmmakers uh, from BAME backgrounds and LGBT filmmakers. So they were making, wanted to make work um, uh, and show the work to those audiences, um, which is pretty amazing if you think about uh, our TV channels today. Um, and there was one woman in particular who worked at Channel 4, um, Caroline Spry. 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 I can't say it in the German way. Uh, she was the commissioning editor. So do you want to tell us a bit about how BD Women came into life and um, how you worked with Caroline and where it got shown? Um, Car Caroline was very uh, supportive of my work. I just uh, literally um, finished training and I'd made one film before. And I sent a treatment to her and she was like, no, 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 next. And then I sent another treatment, uh, which was BD Women, and she was like, oh, this sounds great. Um, you know, you, you've got the commission to make it. And what was great about Caroline was that she was very, um, in a way, she had a very light touch, but she was also respectful of um, intersectional feminism, which is a word now, but it just, it, you didn't have to put intersectional in front of it then. <laughs> it was just feminism. and. Um, yeah, strangely, really. And uh, um, she commissioned the film, and I wanted to make something that was contemporary with a nod back to history, and that's why there's a lot of stuff around the Harlem Renaissance, because that was the first sort of documentation I could have of black um, <laughs> LGBT. It was called gay then, there was one word, gay, um, which is probably now transposed into queer. Um, and uh, that was the earliest recorded uh, lives of people who were living who were living that life. So, um, and I couldn't find anything as early in the UK. And there was one interviewee there who spoke about um, the 1960s in the UK. And it was important for me at that time to get the voice of an older woman because um, older people hold our histories, you know, and unless we speak to them, we, we won't really know what went on back, back in the day. Um, and why there's a marriage in it was because in the Harlem Renaissance, priests, preachers would marry, in the, in the black community, black preachers would marry couples. Um, so, you know, it was, I, I, when I did the research, I found that out and I thought how interesting 
in segregated America, the black community was very affirming of black LGBT people. And so that was important to include then. And um, one of the things we spoke about before when we met, um, you said that uh, a lot of people uh, talk about your work and your films as an archive um, because you work um, with, non with fiction and non-fiction and you cast, uh, use um, real LGBT people. Um, so with BD Women, I mean, was this something that you were very conscious about doing at the beginning of your film career as, um, as a form of activism and kind of reclaiming history? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm not, I'm not a person who, you know, I, I do know what goes on in celebrity culture because I like trash culture, but I, I also know the importance of documenting the fact that we are here and we were here. And so in, in, in all my work, you will find people who have made some cultural contribution to our LGBT culture. So for instance, um, the people that I use in front of the camera or behind the camera um, are people who have made a contribution. So you know, the, the person who plays the butch daddy in BD Women is Pamela Sneed, who is um, a very eminent uh, poet in, in the in USA. Adiola Agbegbi is a, a, a jazz singer and a, a composer. The, the person who composed the music is Dominique Legendre, who's gone on to compose operas at the, at the Royal National Opera. You know, um, so I want people to be inserted into time because very often when we use people who do not come from our communities, it just sort of disappears as, as something like we, we weren't ever there. And it's the same in stud life, you know, uh, Lulu Bellevue, who was uh, one, the co-producer of Stud Life, is also um, very, you know, preeminent in uh, having a magazine, which was a sex-positive magazine in the 90s, called Quim. And Quim is in Stud Life. It's it's where they cut the drugs on. Uh, <laughs> sorry, to <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but you know, it's there. And the work of Della Grace Volcano is on the walls of the apartment. It was actually shot in Della Grace's apartment. So, you know, I want to kind of honor people whose work I value, but whose work we need to to value too, and you know, using Paula and having people in the crew who um, come from communities. So it's a mixture of people who are experienced um, practitioners, but also it's important for me, um, for other people who are not necessarily practitioners, but want an entree into film to work on the film sex who come from LGBT communities or who come from, you know, black or what they call B-A-M-E. Sounds like blame, I hate using that word, but you know, um, black and Asian um, communities to to um, have an entree into film because normally, unless you have an in, you're not going to get in. And I want to provide that in in, in, in my work as well because I know how hard it was for me to have an in. So I want to provide that space where other people can flourish as well. And just going back to um, just BD Women again, um, because I think the history, you know, the story of that film is really interesting. Um, um, so the film, so the film was shown on television. Yeah. It never had um, a theatrical release in in the UK. It was on Channel Four on the second out. It was on out, which is the yeah, second it was series the, the last of Out on one Tuesday. They went yeah. Out. Um, and then Women Make Movies, yeah. uh, basically. Um, bought the film and that's why we've been watching it on a 16 mil print yeah. and that and that print is the only print of it that so the BFI is in it yeah. um, so I think that's just very interesting to kind of think about you know mm -hmm. and that, and you said that the film didn't show at what was called the London Lesbian Gay Film Festival because at that point they didn't show any work that was on television yeah, yeah. <coughs> so then when I was kind of reading around a bit about that time because I think that was a very vibrant time for uh, LGBT filmmakers, uh, filmmakers of color, um, people like Pratiba Palmer and Isaac Julian, another filmmaker, um, Richard Kwiatkowski, he was making work, um, all that came out of Channel 4. And then what happened was um, the, the Out and Out on Tuesday series got cut um, and gay TV suddenly turned up on television. And I read an article that Paul Burston wrote at the time 
um, where it, the tagline was camp, not campaigning. And I think this is the shift of what happened when LGBT um, cinema um, kind of turned mainstream. And there was the lure of the kind of the pink pound. And I was reading some interviews that Caroline, um, that um, Paul Burson had interviewed Caroline, and she was just very prescient about, uh, about that time, about being careful about being co-opted by mainstream culture. And uh, I just wanted to read what she um, said, because I think it's just really, um, it's just very kind of um, contemporary for us now. She said, if you look at the images that have been taken up by ma mainstream in recent years, this was in 95, mostly they can be what described as camp, drag, etc. Those aspects of gay culture that straight, straight society find appealing. The danger is you reproduce what people are comfortable with and not really challenging anything. So I think, you know, your, your work, what's so wonderful is that you consistently challenge the mainstream. You, can, you have consistently stated radical. Um, and um, you, and then you know, then you went on. To, uh, I don't know if this was before Stud Life or after. You en you ended up um, writing your uh, radical film manifesto. Yeah, I, I wrote that manifesto, um, my radical film manifesto, um, because I just thought it's important for people to feel they can make films, and not to think that it's something that's out of reach. I think as minorities a lot of times, and that I speak as a, as a person of color, or you know, as an LGBT person, we think that, and I think we, we hear from our families too, that that's not for us. That's something for other people. Um, we might moan about the stories that other people tell about us, but somehow we feel that we can't tell our own stories. We become almost gagged. I suppose, from telling our truths and telling our stories. So I wrote the manifesto to really make people feel I can do it, one, and my stories are worth telling. Because I think it's important that we believe that our stories are worth telling. Our stories are valuable and, um, and we are hungry. We're, we're actually hungry to, to see lives that we live now and lives that may have been lived in the past is so important. Um, yeah, so it, 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 was for in, it was to inspire me, but to inspire other people too. And I try to do that, you know, in my work as, as much as I can. I have very limited resources, but I, I try to do that as much as I can. And then um, Stud Life. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, when I rewatched that, I mean, I, and I had been to see a couple of other films in this season, and it seems like every film that I had been to see, there had been this fantastic leading actress. You know, the filmmaker had um, cast someone absolutely perfect for that role, and this is um, Tania, who you cast as JJ. Just mm -hmm. I just felt that that role was made for her. Did you come up with the idea of the character for Stud Life before you came up with the idea of the plot? Or how, how did, how, what were your early ideas for oh, the film? Well, my early ideas were based on, on um, in fact, when I, when I came out, it was with gay men. So, you know, and that's something, I, I showed uh, Stud Life to an audience which was predominantly gay men, and they were all started to talk about their best friends who are lesbians or bisexual women. I was like, why don't we never see that in your films then? <laughs> you know? um, because it is a thing, and, um, and I, I just wanted to show that. I also wanted to show that in London, we have this fantastic culture in which our language has been transformed by immigrants who've come here. So words that maybe, you know, people who, who are now in their 60s who are white would never have used, but people who are black in their 60s would use and teenagers use. So it's weird that the teenagers who are both black and white and all, all the kind of ethnicities can speak to older Caribbean people people because they're using the same slang words. And I think it's quite quite magical. So the character of Seb is based on, on those kinds of white people who are gay but very ofe and comfortable in black culture because that's something we don't see. You know, uh, LGBT culture is often 
embedded in whiteness, I think, and the cinema of LGBT is embedded in a whiteness in, in, in terms of aesthetic, in terms of the form, in terms of, you know, even, you know, who they cast, the kinds of music. And I wanted to get away from that notion of LGBT is equal to whiteness and, and um, kind of put some spice in it in, in terms of, you know, stud life, in, in, in terms of showing actually there's another LGBT culture that is very... Um, au courant with uh, black culture, lingo, music, food, style, yeah. And um, what was the, um, we were just remembering the um, reaction of the audience when you premiered the film at Flair. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, well, uh, yeah. What, what is wonderful and you know, you guys were, people laugh at exactly the same places everywhere in the world. I, I find that fascinating. I didn't write the film to be a barrel of laughs, Stella would, um, <laughs> ascertain that I, I wrote it to be like really moody because I'm a moody bastard really um, but um, it came out really funny and um, everywhere in the world people laugh at the same points everywhere in the world people groan at the same points everywhere it's just incredible and so it, it seems to have a universal appeal which I didn't know would be the case when I made the film at all when you when because you were talking about um, that you had the two your two lead characters of uh, of Seb and oh, JJ, yeah. mm -hmm. um, some of the audience at Flair were a little disconcerted by that. Yeah, well, Tania is here in her beautiful um, gown, <laughs> and <laughs> we just stand up, Tania. Sorry to put you on the spot, but <laughs> this is Tania. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> So very different to the character of JJ, but that's called acting. <laughs> um, hate to keep saying it over and over again, but <laughs> that's what actors do. They're not acting who they are, they're acting a character. And um, I worked very hard with Tania um, to perform female masculinity, to live it, to dream it, to um, embody it really. And I was so blessed, um, darling, to have you in the film. Thank you. But it was a shock for the audience because when Tania came out in really like, you know, six inch stilettos, people were like, where's the stud? Where's the stud? Where's <laughs> and we're about to come on stage and go. <laughs> so, but you know, it's due to your superb talent. And did you, um, is, is it true you, had, you made her dress as a stud for a couple of months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, do you want to come and speak about your experience? Yeah. Come, come. Yeah. Come now, come now. <laughs> Hi, y'all. <laughs> hello. 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 <laughs> yes, you did. You did make me... Uh, dress is for a good, it was a good few weeks actually, wasn't it? We had the opportunity, which is rare in film, to rehearse a bit because we our shoot was ten days, and one take each. That was it. It was like next, next, next. It was proper gorilla. It, it was military precision. Yeah, 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 it really was. It was ten days. Ten days shoot, um, which is it's, hey, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, which is unheard of. Um, so <laughs> I had a strap down. I was worried they might not pop back up again. <laughs> um, I packed. Um, and it was really interesting. It was interesting because the way public viewed me, the way I was received, was completely different to the way I was received as, as Tania doing her own thing. Um, it was, I, I was, for one, I was received as a, a young black boy. A lot of people took me for a young, a young black boy. And I then had a real sympathy with our young black boys and the, the treatment they get, the fear and the suspicion that is around them because they're not you know, known, people don't speak to them. Um, having said that, the upshot was as I had my pick of, I was approached by gay men, <laughs> straight women, <laughs> lesbian women. I was like, oh man, I could enjoy this all. <laughs> you know? So that was really, really interesting. Uh, and I guess it brought out 
some of the masculine behavior in, in myself, I was able to discover that. And yeah, it was a real thrill. It was a real thrill to work with Campbell, who stretches you. Um, and, and it's great to watch this again. It's been a while since I've watched this. And it's brought back so many fond memories. And actually, it's, a, it's been a few years now, and I've done different things, and you know, different film and TV. And, and this was such a rock to grow from. And I'm so grateful for, for that experience. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think we'll open it up now um, for comments or questions. Um, if anyone has anything to say. Come on now, don't be shy. We are family here. Yeah. Hey. I, th I think there's a mic as well. Sorry, because I think we're filming. So. <laughs> thank you. Um, like the guy that was acting opposite you, yeah. do you actually see this person as a young white man or an ethnic minority? Um. Just, just as like radicalizing, are we actually looking at people of color, ethnic minorities making this film, both being leads, or are we back to the 80s, salt soul, and it's all about black and white? Just how do you see that? As JJ, does JJ or Tania? Well, or both, okay. Um, at, um, at the moment, I'm thinking Tania, but, you know, maybe that's, that's interesting also. Having met, obviously worked with Carl, we met with Carl, I see Tania, I just see a spirit. Okay. And he's racist and significant. Sure. Um, it's his spirit that comes through, and it's his spirit that talks to me, and we're still friends until this day. Um, so, and I think that's... That happens for a lot of us, you know. But that's that's just generally me, though. I don't I don't see a colour on it, you know. A person, I see the spirit. That's before I see gender or anything else. So yeah, I don't think I necessarily. That's common, but no. yeah. I, you know, his name is Seb Cohen for a reason. I don't know if anybody got that. Yeah. 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 So you know, they're they're kind of little tiny indications of uh, what James Baldwin once says was um, they're white people and they're white people who think they're white. Because actually, you know, we all, believe it or not, came from Africa, if you want to wax lyrical. Um, but there is something happening in London right now that's, that I don't think mainstream film people have cotton on to because we're not part of their dinner parties. Mm -hmm. um, and that is exactly as Tania said, we're living a different life outside of those dinner parties in which people finance TV or finance um, uh, mainstream cinema. We're living a much more blended, fluid culture that is not that England or that Britain, it's something much more exciting and new and vibrant. And um, that's what I want to capture in films, you know. And, you know, the character of Smack Jack can be seen to represent a particular kind of whiteness, but he's also an outsider. He's, he's, the, he's the, the guy who's trying to find this new vibrancy, trying to be part of it, just like I suppose a lot of mainstream cultures trying to be part of it, but um, at, at first there's a resistance, but then he becomes, he, he pushes himself into it, you know, and, and they all live happily ever after, <laughs> which is my dream. <laughs> um, question for Campbell, it, about the difference between the films almost 20 years. First film seems a lot about parents in relation to lives lived through parents. In the second film, it's a world where parents are, I don't think, you know, even mentioned. So I just wondered if you could say something about that shift. Um, yeah, because I didn't want to do a coming out movie. That's why I, I think a lot of... Um, It's the same like transgender films and uh, 
lesbian, gay, bisexual films, the mainstream of, of them is always on the cusp. It's always on the cusp of becoming the thing. And um, I wanted to make films that were beyond the cusp, were after that revelation, were about the lives that we live now, rather than the revelation, the explanation. It's just like, this is a life, get with it or not get with it. There's no explaining or, or anything like that. And I think that that's the difference. I, you know, I'd, I'd, ri I'd visited that then, and I, I don't really want to do that anymore, and, and, and haven't done that since then anyway. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a, a dual question, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, to um, Samir, I, I'm stunned. <laughs> I really am stunned. I just wondered what attracted you to the role of JJ and the dual end is to Campbell. What on earth did you see that made you see JJ? Because she's gone. <laughs> I, 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 I can't see her. Because I'm a hot shit director. <laughs> I think, you know, I auditioned lots of people. It's quite interesting because I did a call out for actors who were gender non-conforming because I'm gender non-conforming myself. And, you know, um, when Selena was curating this, it was like, oh, should I be in this female slot? I don't identify as female. Oh, my God, am I taking up somebody's space? And, you know, just uh, that's a longer discussion. But anyway, I um, saw loads of gender non-conforming people who weren't actors and um, Tania came in to the audition, all butched up, just walked in, took over the space, and acted the hell out of the role, whereas the other people couldn't act. So for me, I'm quite brutal. The, the people that I want to be in the leads should be able to act, and that's the strength, you know, acting first, really, and, you know, talent. Because people get, you know, uh, believe it or not, actors get trained to do this. <laughs> so, you know, I, I really w want to respect people's craft, you know, and the, and the craft they bring to it. Um, so, uh, Tania was, you know, and it, it's not just the words that I wrote. Tania brought things to the role as well. And I, I love that when I work with actors, that they bring things to the role. It's not just me treating them like puppets. Um, but working with them, it's a dialogue, isn't it? Um, you know, we choreographed a lot of things in which you had your input, just, you know, lines that didn't sound right in Tania's mouth, we rewrote some of them. So it's quite important because actors are humans and, and bring their brains, you know, which I, I love and respect, so, yeah. Um, to answer your question, I think there are a couple of actors here tonight that are amazing. Um, and, and my heroes, actually, in this industry. Martina, Martina Lad and Lorna Gale, <laughs> too. Um, Lo Lorna Gale, yeah. Um, as an actor, it is an amazing opportunity to get to play a role like JoJo. They don't come along very often. You know, we play the detectives and the mamas and the nurses, and they're great. They're great roles to have. But when something comes like uh, something like JJ comes along, it's just a gem to kind of fit your body and walk in her shoes, and you know, and find out where she is and, and where her weight is. Um, so yeah, it was it was that sort of attracted me to the role because it was so different from my world. I didn't even really know what a stud was. I was just like, oh, so that's why my friends who identify as masculine don't like when I do certain things. I get it now, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I, did, I don't know. So, yeah, so that's, that's what attracted me. And, of course, getting to work with, yeah, to work, no, yeah. it was getting to work with Campbell. It's like, there we are. It's cool. <laughs> Does anybody else have another? Some of you must have some something. questions. Yes. I knew it, I knew it. Why all the weddings? Why, why is the story so revolving around weddings? <laughs> because I'm evil. Because, <laughs> because if you noticed, every, things went wrong in every single one. 
you know, nothing was perfect. Everything was subverted. Everything n normative was killed, basically. And so I just wanted to just be like, nah, weddings. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the, la the last one, I just thought, oh, yeah, give the little boy something. Uh, all right, then. Because... <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, yeah, that's why. Because uh, uh, there was a lot of marriage debate happening around that time, and I just thought, uh, is that the only thing that we can think of? So let's have fun. And the biggest laugh, interestingly, internationally, is the woman who gets jilted. See how evil you all are. I just wanted to, um, nice to see your films again, Camel, both of them. Um, I just wanted to find out or whether you could talk a little bit more about the context of production of both films. Because I'm fascinated by how, you know, the time um, during which Beady Women was created. I came to London in 91 and then I saw this stuff on Channel 4 and I was just like, wow, this is an amazing country. They're showing stuff like this on television. Yes. And I was blown away by it all, you know, and it's so different now. Yeah. And I just wondered, is it different in, a, in a just a negative way or is it different maybe also in a positive way and it's just different? And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about it. The um, difference, also kind of what, discuss, what discussions went on at the time, you know, when you were doing that stuff with Channel 4, within the mainstream culture in a way. I think it was a different mainstream culture because I, I was a newbie. I mean, I, I just directed one film before that. This, that would never happen now. Me as an individual going to Channel 4 to say, hey, I want to make a movie, you know, uh, give me money. You know, they'll be like, right, bye. <laughs> Talk to Endemol, talk to blah -de blah talk to all these production companies. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have that direct access to commissioner editor anymore. So that's a huge difference. Um, and I didn't come with a long string of, of credits behind my name. I came with, um, I guess, my enthusiasm. I think what's amazing now is um, technology. We have digital technology, which makes everything so accessible. Everyone here can make a movie now, you know? Um, and you don't need to um, show it in the cinema. You can show it on uh, Vimeo or YouTube. You can distribute it yourself digitally. And I think that's, for me, that's empowering. Um, of course, there's still the kind of, the, the standard that's been set up by us movie makers. You've got to be in a cinema. Um, you know, you've got to show your film in, 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 through particular routes, but Stud Life um, went straight to Netflix in the USA. Strangely, it never came to Netflix here. I don't know why. And um, somebody said something. Did somebody say something? I said, right, yeah, it's, it's the effect of Thatcher right policies, that's what Yeah, saying. maybe. But, you know, it. For me, as a British filmmaker, to be able to um, have an international audience mm -hmm. is amazing. And I think digital has allowed that in a way that possibly couldn't have happened before. So uh, I would say for people who, who want to make films now, don't think of just Britain as the market. Think internationally. And for me, as a person of color, internationally is huge because actually we're majority culture. We're not minority culture globally. And always remember that, you know. Um, I don't know. Was that what? What was the question? I think. Yeah, and I think. I think what's exciting now, though, is that the the, the classic distribution model is is falling apart, yeah. and so that's giving voice to all different types of filmmaking uh, and filmmaking practices, yeah. and. Um, I think that's a, this is a really, really exciting time. As you said, there's the theatrical, but there's online, and there's the stuff working in tandem. So I think, um, and as Sophie Mayer, a friend and a collaborator, said that technology is not gendered. You know, no. that's what's exciting about technology. No, it isn't. But also, um, there were very strict rules by distributors, which was the window between things being in the cinema and things being on DVD and then things being on your telly. But, you know, as soon as it's made, people pirate and download it. So it's just like a nonsense to kind of have those strict, you know, delineations. Um, 
things are changing really fast. And I, I, I often think, is this what it was like when people were writing with their pens on parchment and then the printing press came out and you know, people who wrote on parchment were, didn't have a job anymore. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it must have been so scary. And I think that's what's happening now. Um, mainstream cinema is running scared because they can't control things as much as they used to be able to control it. Um, so Definitely companies like Netflix and Amazon are, are have basically have mashed it up. Um, taking mashed the lead it up. and yeah. um, the distributors are catching up. That's what Rita Ora said, mash it up, mash it up. <laughs> Okay, has anybody else got another question or comment? Because I know it's quite late. Oh, yes. Great. Um, hello, I just want to ask, have you got any thoughts on the, like the city space as the general backdrop for the queer culture to flourish? Mm. For example, like the pubs are the, where the people meet each other, communicate with each other, and uh, also like uh, metropolitan uh, London, particular, particularly East London, um, is um, multi-layered and uh, multicultural. Just uh, it's not any connection um, of the city space between the city space or, and um, the LGBT uh, culture. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, I'll try to answer it. I, in, in only the way that I know how. Stud Life was shot in East London um, because I live there and I'm familiar with all the little nooks and crannies. Um, and East London is quite an interesting place because uh, many people come to East London from elsewhere. It's had a long history of immigration. It's had a long history of um, subversive sexual culture as well. And so, I yes, you know, the city is LGBT culture, is the city. However, I think we have to be careful of thinking LGBT culture can only exist in the city. I mean, I made the film about London because I wanted people to appreciate the beauty of London and I didn't want to do that thing where, you know when they have those movies and then they have all these white people, Notting Hill, and, um, <laughs> They, and then they, they show a red bus and you just think, oh my God, I don't, that's not the London I live. You know, that's not the London streets I walk in. And I wanted to show the beauty of the London that I live in, which is just so diverse and rich and, you know, like no other city. And is queer and is multi-ethnic and is just incredibly, I think, futuristic in some, in some ways. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's always what I try to um, bring in, in my work. Somebody else had another question? Oh, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, Campbell, just a, a complete joy to see that film again. Um, I remember seeing it for the first time a few years ago and just seeing, just thinking how, how great it was just to see a film you know, created by an LGBT black person about you know, our diverse you know, capital and lives and cultures and communities. Um, one thing that struck me about the BD woman, there was one, there was uh, the, the uh, there was one person in the film who was talking about how white people have um, colonized, uh, you know, lesbian sexuality, and um, and I wondered, and it, you know, I wondered how, how you felt that might may have changed you know, in in the in. It hasn't. <laughs> it hasn't really. I think, you know, um, Selena spoke about the assimilation of LGBT culture into the mainstream, and what that's done is it's whitewashed LGBT culture, because there was a, a space for um, women of color, for trans people of color to enter into um, LGBT culture at that time, and that space no longer exists. You know, I look at a lot of institutions that are LGBT now, and I can't think of one led by a person of color now. So we have to ask ourselves, how liberated are we? How tolerant are we as an LGBT culture, quote unquote community, quote unquote media, where 
um, white people in power fail to share the privileges that they're gaining. Um, because when people talk about liberation, are they really talking about the liberation of everybody or just their white selves? Yeah. Uh oh, I just said something. <laughs> This may seem an odd formula for a question, but I've recently been attending a series of interviews, uh, and this is the question that's elicited the most interesting answer, and I discussed it with the interviewer tonight, and he said it's because it's such an open question. So the question is, can you tell me something about the BBC? <laughs> Can I tell you something about the BBC? <laughs> do, do you know what I can tell you? Like when you were in that interview room, I can't remember how many months it was ago, Simon, and you looked, it was the, the Today program, you were there and you said, you were there to talk about diversity in the BBC, and you said, huh, I can only say it like a Caribbean person. I'm here to talk about diversity, but may not see no black people here, so I will go on. <laughs> That's what you said, Simon, and I was like, whoa! <laughs> a white man is in the BBC calling out the BBC about racism, and that, that to me said everything. Do you know what I mean? It's like, at what point do I get my value back for paying the, um, what do you call it? The license fee. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm kind of legal. Because I'm just like, you know, people who at the BBC you want my money, but you don't want to um, represent me. Sometimes I do feel like not paying. And if they come for me to really bring that up in a court of law, because it's, what do they call no something without representation? It should be no taxation without representation. In your bomber clock, BBC, that's what I do. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one more question. Um, hi, um, this is more like, um, in terms of, I don't know if you know about the film Tangerine, um, like in terms of like, yeah, like, queer cinema or cutie pop cinema, where do you kind of see it going and like what are your kind of, yeah, like with Tangerine and stuff like that. Um, and also, who is Seb Cohen? <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> He's um, JJ's friend in the film. <laughs> that was his name. When they were doing the naming thing, mm. they gave each other names. Oh, but you were saying there was something like a deeper meaning. Oh yeah, it's oh. a Jewish name. Yeah, Jewish name. Oh. oh. It's like a traditional <laughs> Jewish name. Sorry, I thought everybody was down with the problem. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think the thing, you know, what, uh, what really um, interests me is cutie pox cinema in this country. I think we're fed the idea of queer blackness as being American and, you know, trans, LGBT stuff, it's, it's all American. And I'm really fascinated to see what we can do here. What is our culture? Because our culture is not, we do share a lot in terms of diaspora. However, there are people here who are from um, Africa, the Caribbean, South America. I wanna hear their stories here. You know, I don't just want to be under the dominance of, of USA cinema in terms of black cinema, uh, cutie pox cinema, or LGBT cinema. That would be my answer to that. Um, and America is very good at promoting their own cinema, actually. We're terrible here about doing that to our own, you know. Okay. Um, on that note, um, we're looking forward to your next project. Cam, I know you're, you're filming something at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, fil I'm filming a film around um, desire for the um, 
the trans body, trans masculine body, and the um, female masculine body. I'm also developing a feature which is past financed at the moment. So if there are any financiers here who want to like um, speak to Stella at the back <laughs> about um, putting in the final um, bits of finance, it's a thriller set in South Africa. That's all I can say right now. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to have to finish, but thank you so much to Campbell and to Tania for coming on stage. <laughs>